with it. Um, so, so, so in the last lecture, I talked about this basic stochastic multi arm bandit problem where we put a lot of restriction. We said uh, we play, we, we can only pull one out of n arms. We only learn about the arm we pull. We don't learn about anything else. The arm distribution, the reward is IID from a fixed distribution that doesn't change forever and so on. So next we will look at extensions that will remove every single one of these assumptions basically. So we will, we will look at settings. So contextual bandits where we will remove the assumption that you don't learn about any other arm. We will assume that there is similarities between arms. And when you pull arms, you can also infer information about other arms. We will look at assortment selection where you can pull more than one out of n arms and the choice of the response will depend on the set that you pull rather than just the arm that you pull in, in individually. We will remove the assumption that uh, all you care about is the regret in terms of reward. We will think about constraints on the arms that you can pull and the regret will be in terms of some nonlinear functions and so on. And that will give, get into third topic. Later on tomorrow, you will see the, that we will also remove the IID assumption in the sense that the reward will depend on what you have done in the past. So in, in terms of the state, and so you'll see talks on reinforcement learning where that will happen. So essentially uh, we'll throw away the basic formulation and put bells and whistles on it. But amazingly, the basic two basic techniques we have learned will still be applicable and we will be able to extend them into handling much more general formulations, right? So the first setting, which is, uh, in my view, one of the most useful settings in the sense that I have rarely seen multi arm bandit being applied without considering contextual bandits, okay? So here we think about uh, the case where there is lo lots of arms. So you think about searching a product on Amazon, even if you put a simple thing like headphones, you'll sell, see millions of answers. So you cannot imagine that you can learn individually about every one of them, those headphones by showing every headphone enough number of times. So you do want to think about learning more than uh, the, the thing that you show or the thing that you play uh, by using similarity. And this is a concept that's used in machine learning all the time. We want to learn about similar things by watching one of those, uh, by watching the data about, by looking at data about one of those things. And what we do in machine learning to allow that concept of similarity is, uh, is something it's called like, for example, in supervised learning, we use features. For, so we describe uh, an option or a product by its features. And then we say that similar, the products with similar features must generate similar response. So, so we hope that in features, we captures their essential characteristics so that if we know about a product with one set of features, an another product with similar features, we can hope that it will generate similar response from a similar customer. Okay, so what we will do now is we will we'll take that concept of features and, and models, prediction models based on these features and we'll incorporate that into bandits. So the basic setup that we will look at is called contextual bandits. So we will describe arms by features. So here's the basic idea. So think about the setting with n arms still, but now think of very large number of arms. Essentially, you can also think of continuous space of arms, infinite arms, but to keep discussion simple, let's still think about discrete arms, but large number, n is exponential or whatever you can think about. Ultimately, we, we might want to create bounds that don't even depend on n. Okay. So, but each arm is being described by a context vector or a feature vector. This feature vector could be dependent on both the arm and the time. So it can change with time even for the same arm. So for example, imagine that on Amazon, you are thinking about uh, showing, a pro showing a particular headphone to the customer and you might want to describe that headphone by its features like color and type and so on, not whether it's noise canceling or not. But this feature vector, you might also want to incorporate who you are showing it to or when you are showing it. So are you showing it in the morning or in the evening or in the night? Are you showing it to a customer with certain demographics or location or 
or a customer who has already purchased very expensive products in the past or very cheap products in the past. So if you want to incorporate all that into your features, so then you can think of constructing a feature vector that depends on both the product I, the arm I, and the time or the context of the customer that you're showing it, showing it to. Okay. So, so this is the context vector, and we assume that the reward now is is doesn't depend on just the product, but it depends on so the reward, the expected value, is a dot product of the feature vector and the unknown, the unknown. Uh, and an unknown vector mu. So mu is this parameter that is unknown. That's the unknown part of the distribution. This is now a vector, okay? But this mu importantly is common among all arms and all times. So this is the model parameter that you don't know. It's d-dimensional, but once you know this, you can map any feature vector to its reward, the expected reward, okay? So the expected reward, if you decide to pick one of the uh, so if you decide to play arm i, which has a feature vector x i t right now, let's call that feature vector as x t, the arm that you pull, then you know that the rewards mean will be mu, mu dot product of that feature vector plus some noise. And this noise is i a d, okay? So this is the linear bandit assumption. And this, this means that your reward is generated from a parametric model that depends linearly on this unknown parameter vector and the feature vector. So essentially your problem in terms of information is to learn this unknown parameter vector. If you know this unknown parameter vector, then you know what you should do at any time, irrespective of how many arms you have and how their context change with time. If you knew the model, the mu vector, then you could always decide what to do at any time step by looking at all the options available to you and pulling the arm with the best dot product, okay? And that is what we define as the optimal thing to do. Note that here, the optimal thing is not fixed across time. So in the earlier formulation, we said, if you do the model, you would always pull arm one all the time or arm two all the time. Here, what you would do depends on the context, the time T. So you, you will change what you do, but what doesn't change is the model. You still want to know the model to be able to know what to do. So regret is now defined as what you would do at time t if you knew the model versus what you did do at time t without knowing it or by, le by learning it. So you, what is the expected reward you would have gotten versus what you got, right? Any questions on the model? Yeah. I argue that hrt is independent <laughs> of your decision. What t? t like uh, the noise, like, Oh, it does. It does matter. Yeah. Here we are assuming it is independent. Uh, if if eta t is the the noise model is different for different arms, yeah, you 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 have to take that into account. Yeah. I think there is a name for it. Interstellar noise or something. Yeah. So the question was that is does it matter? Is it important that the noise here doesn't depend on what you chose? And I believe it is. Okay. So, so what is the algorithm now? And we will basically extend our UCB algorithm to this setting now. So it always starts with. So if you th think about UCB algorithm, the general technique, if you apply it to any extension is to first think about what would you do if you don't care about exploration, right? What would you do as a machine learning data driven person who just has some data, some observations, and you want to do the best possible prediction, right? As a frequentist at least. So if you had some data about rewards, right? So if you observed some, you, you have some, you don't know how, why you decided to make certain choices in the past, but whatever you did, now you have some observations. You know what is the, what is the choices you made in the past, the feature vectors of the arms that you pulled in the past, and you know what, the reward, what is the reward you got from it, okay? So you know that the true model satisfied something like this sans the noise, okay? If you ignore the noise, the true model is roughly linear with respect to the context vectors you observed and the rewards that you observed. 
So a true model satisfies this roughly the system of this system of equation based on your past observations. So if you didn't care about exploration, you would find the best prediction of the true model using let's say least square regression, right? So if you minimize least square error and fit a mu, you would get this mu hat estimation at time t, which will be has this standard ex expression like you solve an optimization problem. The optimal solution is to find is, is b inverse uh, some of these excess RS and B inverse B is this matrix of uh, it's all it's, it has many names. One of the names is covariance matrix of this estimator because it's related to the variance in this estimation. Okay, so so this is the standard solution of the least square problem for the linear model, and you can show that uh, even if these excess so it is easy to show this error bound if these excess were IID like independent or oblivious to your uh, to your observations. In this case, they are not oblivious, right? Because you chose the next excess in the past based on the previous observation and so on. They do form a martingale. So, so, so you have that. So slightly more complicated to show this bound in the, in the multi armband setting, but you can still use similar techniques and show this self-normalized tail inequality, which says that the estimator mu hat will be close to the true and the error uh, in terms of this um, matrix uh, matrix norm and the matrix is this is this b matrix is bounded by square root d log t roughly okay and this is important so this is bounded with respect to the this matrix norm b and this b is growing right so when i say this is if i ignore the log t term it's, it's, uh, this term is simply, this term is much smaller than the order of this term, right? And this is growing with time. So you're bounding the error, the error is, is becoming better and better with time because even with the B norm, it's bounded by a fixed quantity, almost fixed quantity, okay? Because B matrix is growing with time. Yeah, right? So, so this is a very non-trivial bound. This is roughly saying that the, the error decreases uh, with time as one over square root the number of trials. Yeah, yeah. I just wondered what kind of the identity matrix to that summation? Is it just so B would be invertible? Yes. You can also have like lambda I here and then talk about how it depends on lambda, but assuming T is very large, we don't care about that. The question was why is there a one identity matrix in the beginning? Uh, basically to make the invertible and have nice arguments. Yeah. Uh, do we really uh, seem like uh, the context is uh, coming from some distribution? No, so context is not, so that's very important. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. This can be completely arbitrary. Uh, we make two important assumptions. Uh, one is you can see the context before making the decision. And the second is uh, the context is oblivious. It's not, it doesn't depend on your decisions, right? So they are external. So think of them as the, what, what customer came to see the product, or what's the time of the day, what's the time, what's the month of the year when you're showing them? Oh, wait, you say, so you know the XRT? You know all these sets you have available to you. You know the feature vectors of the product. So think about you're showing the set, you're deciding which product to show to the customer, but you know the set, you know the features of that product, you know which customer you want to show them to. I see Before the choosing. concern not for the noise problem. You don't know the you don't know this model. So you don't know mu and you don't know the noise you may get. But you know X. If you have the noise, you could just throw it from. If you didn't have the noise, you can probably fit a mu very quickly and then show the almost optimal, like maybe you can show all the orthogonal feature vectors once and then find mu. Yeah. Um, I'm a little confused why we call the arms, like there's nothing that ties an arm today to an arm yesterday, like the Shifra arm today and the Shifra arm yesterday could be completely. Yes, I, I agree. So, in my most of my papers, I don't use I. Uh, so, because the set can be completely different every time. Yeah, it just to carry from the previous discussion, I kept it. Yeah, you can have a completely different N 
at every time. So you have, might have a different set of products available. As long as they have the same feature space, you're fine. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So let's go ahead and see uh, how you will um, use UCB over this. So we know what we will do if you just wanted to find the best estimator, right? And you will have a nice bound in terms of B norm on this estimation. Okay, and uh, this, this bound is somewhat uh, known from linear regression, but it was proven in the right, uh, like right inequality as with all the dependencies in these, in these works, which, is, which was very important and useful. So what do you do in UCB? The same idea, what we want to do is, we want to find, pick an arm based on upper confident estimate of its reward model, okay? So here the reward model is, is basically mu transpose the the xit and i want what an upper confidence bound on this on this mean reward so what we do is we we only want to for develop an upper confidence bound for mu we don't want to develop an upper confidence bound for every arm because this number of arms is very large and as nicole pointed out they could even be changing there may not be a static set of arms also so i really just want to concentrate on finding a bound on mu and use that to compute whichever arm set I'm, I'm given with the best arm. So what I do is in that case, actually, there is no concept of upper bound because mu, there's, it's, there's no monotonicity here. I don't want it necessarily an upper bound because X could have arbitrary negative positive features. Uh, so there's no concept of getting an upper bound. What I can say is that there's a confidence interval, a ball around mu hat where I know that optimal mu lies, right? Based on the error bound, I know if I form this ball around my estimate, the error bound ball, then the optimal mu, the actual mu, not the optimal, the, the true parameter mu lies in this ball CT, okay? So now what I do is whenever I have to make decision, I basically select my arm. I don't know why it's not coming clear here, but what this says is I select my arm based on finding the, on maximizing Z transpose X, where I choose Z in the ball and I choose I. So I choose both the features and the parameter from the ball that maximizes this dot product, okay? So because mu lies in this ball, this will be more than mu transpose XIT for every arm I, right? So I'm doing, so I'm doing max of, Z in this ball. And since mu lies in this ball, this is more than mu transpose XIT for every arm I. And therefore, if I do max over I, this is like a UCB that I'm doing, right? So I pick my arm simply based on this. And now let's see why, uh, how can we bound the regret of this algorithm? And the regret for this algorithm can be bounded. Uh, it has both expected regret bound and high probability regret bound. I am using this old tilde notation to, to hide all the logarithmic terms because they are more than one logarithmic terms, unlike the n arm bandit here. So I'm, there are some log n, log t, log one over delta terms in here. But these are the, the, the sublinear terms that are there. So the important thing to note here is that it doesn't depend at all on the number of arms. Uh, and it depends linearly on the dimension of the feature vector. So the idea is that since what you're learning is d-dimensional, it doesn't matter how many arms you have to make decision among, you, you, information is only this. If you do, have, if you do know, have a finite number of arms, you can get slightly better, uh, better bound in terms of log of n and t. So if you, if you believe that n is, is not too much, so you don't mind a dependence on log n, then you can get a dependence on in better dependence on the dimension. So if your n is finite, then this might be a use. So if your context is changing with time, but number of arms is still small, this is a better, better bound. Okay. So, so Jim, yeah. So the fact that we started our 
adversarial bandit problem. Adversarial bandit. It's not adversarial bandit. You mean adversarial context. So you can, can use the algorithm for the linear adversarial bandit to solve this problem. You can use the algorithm for just like on a optimization with other with bandit feedback to solve this problem. Just a special thing. Um, yeah, let's let's talk about yeah. that. Yeah. All right. So there's also a lower bound uh, for for this setting, which is uh, say which is oh actually I miscited the lower bound. I believe the lower bound is square root dt for the finite arm case, not d not d square root t. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. It sounded like you said that when you have a finite number of arms, you can get log t regret. Is that right? Or is it square root t regret? This one? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> no, square root d log. Oh, square root d t. Yes. Yeah, okay. No, no. There is still. Right. There is. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You can just get an improvement of square root d. Like if you substitute n by exponential in d, then you can get this the same. Uh, do you assume your feature regret X? X is not bounded, but we assume the reward is sub Gaussian. Or uh, so there are some assumptions. I think the assumption is mu is bounded, ha has a bounded norm, and the reward is bounded between 0 and 1, or it's sub Gaussian. So the X star should be bounded, right? X star, I mean, why is it X star? Oh, it doesn't star. have to be. X star is one of, oh, it is one of the paths of the paths. It's one of the X's available to you. So this is a set of contexts available to you. You pick one of them to play, and one of them is the best thing to do. The X star is the one that's best thing, is the context of the arm that's the best one right now. And XT is the context of the arm that you don't assume about it a space of x. Not really. Like if you have reward bounded, you don't need the uh, boundaries. Yeah. How lucky are you that xt is not bounded, so xt w is bounded? Yeah, I mean you have to make a setting like that, but I'm saying that technically you don't need it. I see. So the signs of XT really have to. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like there might be a very structured process which can generate such such uh, rewards, but uh, technique the proof doesn't mean. Anything. Yeah, it might be sparse or yeah, certain dimensions combine always. You always have two complementary things. I don't want to rule out such processes that generate such rewards. Yeah. Classic Mojang family problem of special Yes. So, so you can, in fact, I will discuss it in the proof. You can generate classic multi arm bandit problem by saying xit is just like the indicator vector with arm i, and mu vector is simply the vector of mu1 to mu n. So then, the, then this is simply mu i. Yeah. You still have the problem with the independence of noise or something? You still have what? Do you still have a restriction in what what ordinary bandits fit into this model because of the independence of beta? Um, uh, let's think. Oh, that's what you mean then to that. I don't think that, I think that that's fine. But let me think about that. Yeah, I think it should be okay. It's simply the reward mean, reward the uh, distributions. Uh, it's the difference between the mean and the actual actual uh, reward. I'm not yeah, but in that case, like Bernoulli has a noise that depends on. Yeah, so there might be generalizations possible here in the team that allow me. Yeah. Square root of nt, right? Because the dimension is n. So d is n in this case. Yeah, but uh, in the uh, uh, No, but that's instance specific. This is instance free. So this is comparable to the square root nt log t of the NOD one. 
So D is N here. Right. Let's move on. So, so I want to just discuss like a uh, high level of proof here, um, just so that like it de demystifies a little bit of what is happening here, right? So, so what is the regret here? So regret we said is the sum of over time of what the optimal would do minus what you did. Okay, the context you chose versus the optimal. And basic thing that we will do is use optimism, right? So we, we will use the fact that we, we didn't pick some arbitrary thing, we picked something very, uh, very smart, very specific. So, uh, so the inequality we will use is that xt star times mu is in fact smaller than, uh, than what, what we picked in the sense of max xt times T times max over Z. So how do we show that is because the, the way we, so first of all, this is smaller than max over I, I T times mu, okay? Simply by max property. Then we say this is smaller than max over Z slash in CT, I slash in N, XIT times mu. And this is true because XIT times Z. So this is true simply because the confidence intervals contains mu, right? So because of that, this is smaller. And, and since we actually picked our arm to play based on this, so remember we picked arm I for as arg max of this term. So this is equal to max over Z in CT, XT times Z. because our choice of, of i and z maximizes this dot product. So now that we have this, we will get almost uh, what we want. Grid bound, so let's take this. This is smaller than max over z in ct. We did this whole thing to make sure that xt appears on both sides instead of xt star and xt, which is because the context we played. So then we can bound the error in, in the estimation along the direction that we observed. So here, the, there was an error in the direction of xt star versus an error in the direction of xt. Now, now the error between z and mu is both in the direction of xt. And we know what's the error between Z and mu is because Z is in CT, the confidence ball that we have. So we can use that to say that this is smaller than, first of all, we will decompose it like this. Let's call this as ZT, the, the arg max of this thing as ZT. So we, we, we decompose is as the norm inverse of BT and the norm over BT. So the matrix norm with respect to BT. So BT was this covariance matrix. And we know that this is bounded. This was the error bound provided to us by confidence interval by least square estimate has this error bounded by square root D log T. Okay. So we know that, that anything in the confidence interval is close in this, in this norm. So if you ignore this log T, basically we have a bound here that doesn't grow with time. Okay, so this is a multiplicative term here that we can ignore. Mainly we are concerned about this part. So we are mainly concerned about bounding this, which is xt transpose bt inverse xt. Okay, so this is the main term that we are concerned about. Anything, any bound we get on this, we will just multiply it by square root d and get a regret bound. 
So what is this term here? This is one of actually the key terms that will appear in any regret analysis you will do. And the beauty of this term is that it now at this point, it doesn't even matter how you chose your arms. The, the idea that this BT is, 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 is formulated in a way that you will decrease your error no matter what. So let's look at this term BT here. So BT, remember, is this matrix, the covariance matrix or the design matrix, um, as people call it, S equals one to T minus one, X, X, XS transpose. Okay. And the term you are interested in is in XT, BT inverse XT. So what is happening here is that any given time, maybe this term is very large. You could say, how do I know this term is not very large? So this term could be very large in at any given point. Why would this be large? Probably if you think about this BT, it has large eigenvalues in the direction in which no, none of the excess is there, right? So BT inverse will have large eigen, like a, so this term, it will result into a large eigenvalue if there is no excess that is in parallel to XT. So it's very orthogonal. All the previous contexts that you observe are in directions that are very orthogonal to XT. That is a bad case, okay? But, why, but that is, a, in, in a way, it's good because, next, because it means you kind of explored in a direction XT, which was not observed so far. And that XT, XT transpose is going to get added to BT in the next step. So if this, this term is big, then in the next term, any XT parallel to this XT will result in a small term. Okay, so you're kind of, if you're losing right now, because your XT is very orthogonal to the previous axis, you will gain all the time in the future, because now if you see any feature vector parallel or close to parallel to this one, you'll have a small term. So every loss right now is information gain for the future. And to see that very precisely, let's look at the example that uh, the gentleman here pointed out. Think about this XTIs, which are one I, right? So it's like, let's say static context, like the multi arm bandit setting with only one in, the feature vector is simply one in the ith entry and rest everywhere. In that case, what happens is BT is simply this. If you think about what XS XS transpose is, it's simply one one transpose, which means one entry in the diagonal at S and zero everywhere. So BT simply is N1 T, N2 T, number of plays that you did for every arm and zero everywhere, okay? So this is your, your BT plus one. I mean, I ignored the plus one, but yeah, plus one everywhere. So this is what BT is. So what is this weird looking term there? In that setting, this weird looking term is simply square root of one I BT inverse one I. It's nothing but our familiar term NIT. So this term here is nothing there but this in the multi unbended setting. So what you are trying to mean to, to bound here in the multi unbended setting is, so this, if you're trying to bound the sum, you're trying to bound this. So now let's look at why this term is bounded. Now I don't even have to say that how I played these arms that arm I grows fast enough or not. You can show that this term will always be bounded irrespective of how you chose the arms because there's only so much you can do, right? So, so there's always information you will gain. So if you look at this term, okay, so let's divide it based on time, on based on arms. So I equals one to N, let's look at time at which I was played, okay? I just rewrote that thing like this, right? So I just sum, summed over I and just look at the time step at which I was played. What does this term? This term, every time the I is played, and it increases by one. So this is simply, So this is simply one over one plus one over square root two plus one over square root three and so on till one over square root NIT. Okay. So now this simply sums up to square root NIT roughly, right? So, or less, let's say less than equal to. Now, what is the worst value of this? There are only T trials. How can you make this the largest possible? is to just have equal number of 
so plays of because this is like a function that's maximized if n i t was all one over n t over n. Okay, so the worst value of this is if everyone was t over n, and that's square root n t. Okay, so basically this is what is happening except it's very easy to see in the multi unbanded setting because you can see that every time you have a large value you and you play that arm you see a decrease in the next term and then the next term and the next term but the same thing is happening here whenever you have a large value of xt bt inverse it means bt does not have anything in that direction which means you gain by adding this in and decrease the next term and the next term and so on okay and this Intuition is basically formalized in, in Peter Auer's proof uh, or lemma where they show that the eigenvalues decrease every time by a certain amount and therefore the sum always is bounded. And in fact, that one lemma is kind of used in almost all the proofs of linear bandits to show this last term is bounded, okay? All right, any questions? Yeah. yeah. Intuitively, why isn't there like a dependence on distribution of the eta t's? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, intuitively, why isn't there a dependence on, let's say, the eta t's? So eta t's are <clears throat> supposed to be like the noise um, added to the, uh, the dark product? Oh, we assume bounded noise. Is that? Well, yeah. We assume bounded noise or sub Gaussian noise with a spread of one. Well, so everything is normalized to one. Yeah. Yeah. If there is a, a bound of L, or a spread of L in the noise, you will scale everything by L. Any other question? <clears throat> yeah, if you have any doubts about the proof, let me know because the other next one will depend on this one. So the sequential dependence. Yeah. This matrix B T uh, changes over time. Mm -hmm. It's is this matrix. Yeah, yeah. it grows larger every yes. yeah. uh, so B T is not bound. No. I mean it's it's bounded by T, but yeah. It grow, is growing every step, yes. The the Leiden values are increasing. Yeah, so that's why, why I was emphasizing the significance of, of this bound, right? So it, it is growing, but the error is bounded logarithmically because you're also new is you're getting more and more samples. So new is getting closer to new hat. So this bound is not saying the error between new and new hat is fixed. It's saying it's decreasing with time because the norm is the, the norm that you're taking with respect to that matrix is growing. So you are actually mu is getting closer to mu hat, but in this direct, these directions. So why is that now? I would have expected this I mean, T is probably <laughs> So it's like, it's, that's why I like to think of the example of the bandits, right? So there we say that mu, mu i minus mu hat is less than one over square root, whatever n. So this is basically saying mu minus mu hat times square root m is less than a constant. That's what this is saying. Yes, but here it's t and not square root. Here? No, no, but this is a norm, right? So this is a square root. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's L2. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's not square, yeah, it's it's L2 norm, like uh, matrix norm, so it's x transpose bx. Yeah. It seems to me that bt can go very fast. X is. Oh, okay. So you are right in that sense that it's probably assumed that the c depends on the norm of x or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or it relies on the fact that x transpose mu is bounded. Yeah. yeah, if x grows quickly, then this bt also will be quickly. Yeah. But we, yeah, you assume that X transpose 
because it's not the storm involves new minus new minus. Yes, yeah, there are probably some assumptions there to make sure that everything is. Let's assume for now that X is bounded. Okay, X is bounded, new is bounded. Yeah, I'm sure there are there are small extensions possible in, in that. You had a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't want to get into that rabbit hole of finding the right setup. Yeah. What kind of optimal Yeah. So this is. So it's a self-normalized state inequality. Yeah. One of the key difficulties in proving this is that this is this is a not a constant, right? So this is also depends on these. And these are not IID, so it's a self-normalized. So this is also a generated from a stochastic process. So right. it's a self-normalized so self It's a martingale, yeah. So which one are you using two or what are you using? Again? It's like I they proved using basic uh like derivation of Marco inequality and then proving using exponential and so, so on. They use like they use Not like exponential concentration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So moving on. So now if you want to do, it seems like I'll only be able to do contextual analysis today. But if you want to do now Thompson sampling, uh the the idea is, is very similar. You you do the basic step the same way. You, you compute a least square estimator you had, and then instead of uh, instead of uh, instead of forming this confidence goal and finding the extreme point in this goal, so remember in the in the uh, in the UCB you form the confidence ball and then you said find the maximum i and and the estimate in the ball the combination of which maximizes x transpose mu. So you're finding an extreme like on the boundary of this ball, basically an extreme point where the X transpose mu is maximized and you're playing according to that. So similar idea to UCB where you found the extreme point of the confidence interval and played according to that. So now instead of doing that, you basically put a distribution on this ball. So you say that let's look at the our estimate and and the posterior, you can again show using Bayes rule that the posterior will be of this form, but you can show posterior at any time, assuming Gaussian prior, will be the Gaussian with the mu and mu hat computed the same way as we computed here, the least square estimator. And the, 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 the mean of the posterior will actually be the least square esti error estimator. And the, the covariance turns out to be the the covariance matrix and this this fact is not like so now there are various things in which this kind of things appear where the posterior is actually has the covariance matrix as this which is some why some sometimes this is referred to as covariance matrix okay but we use that to design a from the sampling algorithm where we say that now instead of choosing a mu in this ball as an extreme point sample a mu from this gaussian and then make your decision based on the sample parameter Okay, so you simply uh, use the sample mu tilde from the from this Gaussian multivariate Gaussian, and you take the action that maximizes the dot product of your sample and the so you basically remove that other max where you were doing max over the confidence ball, and you simply max the sample. Okay, and we have to make the proofs work. We give a small boost here, which is like some logarithmic boost. Right. Uh, I will not go through the proofs of this one. It has some complications in the sense that uh, you don't have this first step, basically. So you can't do this step because you don't have optimism. So you have to kind of say that uh, you don't you don't play optimistically, but you do play the good arm enough and so on. So but let's not go into that. But we can prove uh, basically a bound uh, which is comparable. So we instead of d, we have d, d raised to three by two, so an x, extra square root d. And in fact, it's not clear so far if this square root d can be removed. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there is like this algorithm achieves the lower bound, but there are settings in which this algorithm is not polynomial time. This one is, so it's not clear. And there are other polynomial time algorithms which also have d square d raised to three by two. So it's not even clear if there is a polynomial time algorithm that can get you 
the lower bound, the information theoretic lower bound. So this is something that is a very niche problem, but very cute problem. If someone wants to discuss with me later on, uh, let me know, okay? So uh, there are other contextual formulations. In particular, you can uh, generalize the linear bandit to a very useful setting where you still have linear model, but you also have a one-dimensional one function, like a one single argument function over that linear model. So your, your reward may be a nonlinear function of that linear parametric function. So you might have log mu transpose x, for example, right? And then depending on the Lipschitz constants and things like that, you cannot still get uh, regret bounds using similar techniques. And there are even further generalizations like, uh, like you just have some function, not even nonlinear function on a metric space and you want to just uh, do a general uh, exploration of the metric space, adaptive exploration of the metric space. And those techniques are different from UCB. For example, here they use a zooming algorithm with generally, which assumes a general metric space and zooms into the right parts of the metric space to do exploration. And if you're interested, just look, look at those, those references. I think some of the authors will also be here during the program and you can talk to them. So I want to briefly mention in the last 10 minutes uh, to anyone has any questions about the linear bandits before I move on? Maybe one quick question. No. Okay. So, yeah. How important is the first thing you found when you presented? Frankly, I don't remember exactly what it was right now. Uh, it has been a while. Uh, I believe it's log ethnic, but I may be like, don't quote me on it. Yeah. I have to look up and see what it was. How important, did you ask how important it was? So in, 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 uh, in, it, in the experiments we did, we never used the boost and it works, but for proofs it's important. So that's my best answer. Yeah. But experiments are never like, you can change the setting and maybe it won't work in some settings. Okay, so I want to discuss a little bit two other formulations. One is assortment optimization. And assortment optimization is actually a very classic problem in OR where you think about presenting an assortment of products and then think about externality that we impose on other products. So you don't want to say that, oh, if I product, present product I, it will be selected with probability PI. You want to think about the set you give and how that affects a person's choice behavior. Because if there is a very expensive product place with very cheap products, that expensive product may appear even more expensive than it was presented alone. So those kind of externalities, if you think about them, then the probability that a customer chooses a product I, that you see a click or a purchase of product I from a set S, may not get made, may, be, may not be defined in terms of just some PI or PJ. Right? So it might be some complicated function of this set that you present. So this makes the problem a combinatorial problem because in order to learn the, the choice probability of product I, you have to kind of present different within different combinations to be able to learn about. And in general, this could be very hard if you have no structure on how a set affects the choice probability of a particular product. Therefore, you might want to think about some structural assumptions so that you can make the problem simpler. So one structure assumption is to, uh, I will skip over the examples. I'm sure you all can imagine the examples in which such externalities will occur. So one structure, which is a very classic model in OR is, is to think about the, and, and in fact, it's, it's popular as well, as well is the logic model, right? So multinomial logic model, which is, uh, you think about the assumption, basic assumption of the dependence of irrelevant order. So in fact, you can see, show that roughly if you assume independence of irrelevant alternatives, this is the model you will come up with. So independence of irrelevant uh, alternatives means that the relative choice probability of two products doesn't change based on who you present it with. So, so the PI over PJ is same across the sort. So just because a third product was presented, I don't start liking this product compared to this other one more. So the, in particular, in this 
in this uh, in this model, you see that pi over pj is same for all the sets. It's always e raised to theta i over e raised to theta j. It doesn't matter what set is presented. But but if you talk about a particular choice property of product i, then it is a normalized version of the products that were presented in that set. And this one is basically thought of as the probability of no choice. So, you, so the probability of making no choice is one over the sum, and the rest of them have this, this choice point. Right? So here the, the idea is uh, that the, the model is nice because now, even though the problem is combinatorial in the sense that you could potentially be thinking about two raised to n possible sets that you want to learn about, but the model is parametric with only n parameters, theta one to theta n. So if you know these n parameters, then you could always then you can select which set to present without going through all possible combinatorial set of choices. Okay. So now you go back to your example of like contextual bandits. There also we said that even though there could be many arms here, the arms think of arms as the possible sets that you can show to the customer which is combinatorial, but if you know this one the uh, d-dimensional parameter there, we could choose any times what's the optimal thing to do. Same way here, if I know this n-dimensional parameter, I could choose which of these combinatorial many sets to present to the customer, because that would be the optimal set in terms of the choice, maximizing some kind of revenue given the choice problem. So what are we trying to maximize here? So we, we think about this problem where you have n products, they have these unknown parameters. You want to recommend a product, a, a set assortment of products of size at most k. So it's a limited capacity choice. And then you observe a revenue RIT. The revenue is basically uh, expected revenue is basically the the ri there's a fixed ri revenue okay you assume you know the what you will get if you if customer purchases this. so you have a product has a price if the customer purchases it you know the revenue you will make so ri is known but you don't know whether the customer will in fact choose it or not so this is the revenue you will get if you show a set s of products okay. and so you observe an instantiation of that revenue, and based on that, you want to do an estimation of the parameters theta of the model. And your goal is to maximize the total revenue. So if you think about the contextual benefit example, the problem is not very different. It's just the model is different, right? So you are now presenting something, uh, a, a set, which has a parameter, unknown parameter vector, and you want to learn this as unknown parameter vectors, you can do a best maximum likelihood estimate of this parameter from your observations. But then you don't want to play according to those. You want to do some UCB or function sampling over that parameter to make your choice. That will basically, that is basically the idea uh, with some issues. So, so, so there are some issues of getting an estimate of theta because you only observe the product that was purchased you don't get feedback, the full feedback of other products and so on, but uh, but it's it's an extension of the same same techniques. You for UCB, you can get uh, square root empty bounds and same for Thompson sampling. But one of the things interesting things about this paper is that you don't get a nice conjugate behavior here because what happens is you have a prior on theta. Then you observe a sample from this model, and the posterior is not as directly obtainable as it was in the multi-non bandit setting. So you have to do a posterior approximation. So we do a Gaussian approximation of the posterior to get the boundaries. Uh, the final topic I want to mention, I won't spend too much time on it, uh, but I just wanted to put it out there so that if you're wondering, oh, I have a bandit problem, but it has these constraints and it has this nonlinear reports, I want to say okay, most of it has been done already. So, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, let's see. So, uh, so one of the things that you might have been uh, wondering is, okay, we have this total number of pulls is T, but you could potentially put pull the same arm, might be the solution, might be pull the same arm all the time. And that seems very impractical most of the time. Nobody pulls like shows one product all the time. So how, what is going wrong here? 
It's because we didn't put any constraints on how much you can use a particular arm or how much or, or other constraints on how diverse you want the location to be, or there are some advertisers who want to show their ads. So you, even if an ad generates the most interest, you can't keep just showing one ad all the time because you want to make other advertisers happy as well, or, or they have limited budgets and so on. So how do we incorporate all those things here? So what you want to think about is, first of all, constraints. So you want to say, yeah, you want to pull the best arm, but there are restrictions. So you can't pull the, even if you know this is the best arm, you can't pull it all the time. There might be budget constraints. Or you might also want to think about the rewards may not be just the sum of rewards. Maybe there is a there is a fairness constraint, like you want to minimize the max, or you want to maximize the main reward of different entities that were involved. Or you want to think about the, uh, not just like if I'm showing an ad or showing search results, maybe you want to maximize the satisfaction of the customer. So you want to maximize the minimum satisfied customer or something like that. So there might be a different non-linear objectives that you want to put on aggregate rewards. And these, so, so when you pull an arm, you might see different kinds of rewards, right? So you might see that, yes, you pulled an arm which made the advertiser this much happy and customer this much happy. Now there are two entities. So which one do you want to maximize? Maybe you want to have some combination of advertiser happiness and customer's happiness or seller's happiness and the buyer's happiness. So how do you combine those into, into non-linear rewards? So the general setting uh, that, that one we can solve at this point is think about whenever you pull an arm, you generate a d-dimensional vector. Now, whether it's a reward vector or a cost vector, Let's not discuss that. It's just a d-dimensional vector of observations. Now, your, your objective could be some function of the aggregate of the, this d-dimensional vector. So maybe the first two components of this d-dimensional vector is the reward, and your objective will, might be the min of the two rewards. Okay? The min of the advertiser rewards and the, uh, and the buyer's reward, the seller's reward and the buyer's reward, for example. Or there might be, that, that there might be some demographics and you want to say there are four communities and you aggregate the rewards of different communities and different components of that vector and you want to say maximize the min of these four different communities as a fairness requirement. So the, this is all allowed as long as f is a concave function, for example, min is a concave function and so on. The other, or you can also put constraints on, so maybe the last 10 components of that vector are costs. And you can say that the sum of the cost should lie in some context, or uh, or the any yeah any convex set, which means you can put a convex function on that vector and put some constraint on that. So if you have that, uh, then again you can use a uh, use a UCB. You have to be a little careful on designing, but again the idea of having a confidence ball still works. So you basically think about your vector of observations and you can develop a uh, confidence interval on each component of that vector. And you can simply say that every time you want to pull an arm, meaning the decisions that you want to take, you, you take that based on the probability vector P, which maximizes your whole constraint optimization problem. So you think about your confidence intervals on the vector and you say that find the find, maximize. So this is like the double maximization that we did, did in UCB, right? We said maximize over arms, but also maximize over the estimate in the confidence form. So same thing I'm doing here, I'm maximizing over the estimate in the ball, and I'm finding the best P. Here I'm minimizing because it's a constraint. So I'm finding the most pessimistic estimate instead of optimistic. But it's the same idea as what we saw in contextual setting. You take a confidence interval and find the worst or the best estimate in that set. And you can show that doing that, you can have a regret, which uh, which is similar order as we saw in the in the bandit settings. And but we, we also have in general there is a regretting constraint, which means constraint might be violated by this much. You can have like constraint must be satisfied constraint and like if you want the constraint have to be satisfied you can do it in general basically what can happen if your if your constraint set is such that 
you can go in and out of it all the time, then you then you, I don't think it's possible to avoid this part. But you have a constraint set which always you approach from downwards. For example, if you have a budget constraint, then you always are within the budget, and at some point you might exceed it. So there's a proper de definition of this convex set, which is like a downward flow set. So if you have such a constraint which has some body and you always approach it from bottom, and at some point you might exceed it, and this may not be just budget constraint, you can have any such ball or anything where there's a body of the ball and you, you always approach it from below, then you can achieve uh, without this. So you can avoid this. You can make sure you're always within the constraints because you're starting from the bottom and you can make sure you never exceed the exceed the boundary and you can get a regret only in the objective, for example, for budget constraints. So that was a very, very quick overview, sorry, uh, about that, about the extensions, but hopefully I provided you pointers. If you are interested, you can look up these papers uh, and see if they apply to your problem. Thank you. Lovely for us to try around for that part of the semester. Yeah. Catching up with maybe if you could, if there are any quick questions. Right. I'm also on the coffee break. People want to come in there. Right. Okay, in that case, let's thank Shupra again. Uh, It was an outstanding tutorial. Like, I've seen some of this stuff before, but still, like, I think every time we see this tutorial, you learn something new from it. So uh, that's a great start to this program, but we're going to continue after lunch. So we'll be reconvene at two. Um, so we're going to sort of switch to this was more about the stochastic side. We're going to switch after lunch to thinking about the yeah, adversarial side of bandits and then how can we kind of get in between. See you all up.